the moment that you have the mosaic pieces that you don't have um, a single family tree. You have thousands of family trees in your genome. We are working on um, comparative um, genomics where we actually compare the genomes of people to each other and you know uh, people, humans to other non-human uh, primate species like chimpanzees um, to really understand what makes us human. Mm. Ooh, what are these? We take salivary proteins, LUBA um, immobilizes them on nitrocellulose plots in various concentrations and then we overlay them with fluorescent labeled bacteria. It, I think it got started with the study that we did here in, in my lab is comparing the saliva of the chimpanzees with the humans. We came up with about a good handful of candidates, maybe up to 12, that are differently expressed, grossly differently expressed between chimpanzees and humans. We have all these body fluids and saliva is one of them. At the entrance of our mouth, which is basically the entrance to everything that goes inside our body. Here I think he has samples from dogs, I think, and this is human saliva. I see. While we are doing this on the site, we have little discoveries that are of interest to other people. We chose MOOC 7 because you called it was it very variable. The lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you saw these copy number variation. But there's one protein, MOOC7, that seems to be in humans, it's much larger. And that was very curious to me as an evolution geneticist because you don't expect that, uh, that you have a clear difference in size of a major protein of sal you know, in saliva. So we wanted to understand what's going on. So the protein that this gene um, is making, we call it the, um, it's like a toilet brush or like a brush where um, it's relatively rigid, so it's like a stick, and um, you have these uh, individual units, the, these repeat units uh, made from amino acids. So th that's very intriguing because um, uh, that actually is a nice um, evolutionary shortcut, if you will. And uh, we think that it has to do with um, adapting to particular pathogenic pressures. And when we are looking at that uh, brush in humans, you have this particular type, but they have all these mutations that differentiates it from rest of the humans. He found out, and he was very excited about that, that there is a, must be a small group of individuals um, very uh, in a confined area in Africa that have a different haplotype, as he calls it, with a different copy number um, than the rest of the population on this earth. It was very unusual, so we basically made a lot of um, statistical uh, and computational analysis. He called it a ghost species because there are no skeletal remains. It turns out that the best explanation for that really divergent, unusual uh, version of, of this protein in humans is um, if we invoke um, an interrogation event, an admixture event. So in fact, I gave uh, the example of uh, go to a time machine and go to like say 70,000, 100,000 years ago um, in the world, we almost have um, a Lord of the Rings world where we have um, modern humans um, kind of expanded in Africa um, and uh, Neanderthals living in, uh, living in Europe, Denisovans is living probably in somewhere in Asia and then there are also hobbits, this um, Homo florensis, living in Indonesian islands. So suddenly you have at least four, potentially more, subspecies of humans living at the same time. And then what happened is that humans expanded, they go uh, high in population, they met with these guys, and it seems that there's some genetic exchange. This is a fascinating little world that completely absorbs me, just from a theoretical point of view, without any ramifications as to translation into whether this is good for human health or studying disease or so. But then of course as time goes on we will make discoveries um, that will tell us um, about human oral disease. Um, we haven't reached that stage yet but you have to be prepared that those discoveries happen mostly by serendipity.